This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. I'm your host, Steve Gould, as the good man said in the intro. Guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, this is episode number 82. 82 in the hole, which is which is unbelievable, which is so cool. Um, I want to thank you guys so much for the continued support. Thank you. Um, picked up a couple more uh, monthly subscribers, which is amazing. You guys, um, it doesn't matter how little it is, it goes into the the pool and it pays for the show's expenses and uh, I just really appreciate it. I want to do a roll call real quick on that. I want to thank uh, Tony Fahey, Corey Payne, Jacob Ruth, Carmen East, Rich Emery, the great William James Long from William James Long Investigations, Samantha Harper, the great Gary Steiner, uh, Richard Wilson, Scott O'Donnell, David Diaz, Timothy Wright. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. I truly, truly appreciate it. Some exciting things coming up on the podcast. I've um, I've uh, received a sponsor- sponsorship. So someone's going to be sponsoring the podcast, which is really cool. And it's a really amazing and great product. I can't wait to tell you guys about. So that's coming down the pipe. Uh, and thank you also for the rating and reviewing on iTunes. I think we're up to 533 reviews. We're at like 4.8 stars out of five, which is fantastic. There's some haters in there. You're not, it's not, you're not going to escape the haters when your podcast starts getting larger, especially when it's law enforcement. They're just people just sign on just, just to call me a douche. Cause I'm a cop. So <laughs> I can't avoid that. So 4.8 out of five is pretty good when you factor that in. Um, so today's guest is he's one of those guests where we could talk probably for four hours. Um, eight hours, a whole, a whole day with this guy about his stories. He's got, uh, a gigantic resume. He's, um, you know, legendary status in the law enforcement world, especially NYPD. Um, his name is Ralph Friedman. Um, he's a New York City, he was a New York City detective second grade in the, through the 70s and 80s. Over 2,000 arrests. He was in 15 shoot 'em ups. He's got four justified uh, fatal shootings. He's the most decorated detective in NYPD's 175-year history. I think it's 175 years uh, at this point. Uh, And he he had a book in 2017 called Street Warrior. You can see that on Amazon. It gets uh, crazy good reviews. I think almost 400 reviews now. Uh, Here's a picture of it, Street Warrior. So check that out. I will obviously link that uh, in the show notes and on the website. And um, he actually has a new show on uh, Discovery. It's available on Amazon Prime and Apple TV and probably most places you can stream, uh, Street Justice, The Bronx. So uh, needless to say, I'm super, super excited to have this guy on. Um, just uh, it's an honor to, to do the interview, and I can't wait to hear what he has to say. Um, without further ado, let me bring on Ralph Friedman. Sir, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Steve. Happy to be here. Oh, I'm I'm so excited to have you. I uh, was doing my my due diligence, doing my Google uh, in- investigation Thanks. on you, and um, boy, oh boy! I mean, you have people singing your accolades like uh, like um, Chuck Zito, which is incredible. Yeah, good, friend good friend of mine. Yeah, is probably about forty five years. In, in, incredible. I mean, I remember I listened to Howard Stern for so many years and um, Chuck Zito's stories and just him as a persona w- was so exciting, fun, and terrifying of a guy. You know, and he, this guy called you. You know Chuck, though, if you know him and he knows you, he's a great guy. You know, and he's doing a lot of movie work, uh, which he's really good at. He started off doing stunt work. You know, I met him in a tattoo parlor back in probably 1971. Wow. Friend of a mutual friend, Big Joe, you know, in the tattoo parlor in Mount Vernon. And I met Chuck there, and we just hit it off. You know, we both were into uh, physical fitness and bodybuilding and motorcycles and tattoos. And, uh, you know, we we're on different sides of the fence, but we always respected each other. You know, and he was a, he's a great guy as a friend. That's, that's great. I mean, part of his quote, when he was talking about you is, um, I mean, Chuck Zito is known to all of us guys in America as one of the toughest guys out there. 
and he called you a tough guy. So I said, this guy, <laughs> this guy Friedman must be an animal. Uh, Chuck gives me respect and I give him respect. It goes both ways. And, uh, uh, you know, we've just been friends over the years, you know, we don't hang out all the time, but our paths always cross. And we remember we were good friends from back then. That's that's really cool. And then the other one was a former guest of uh, Things Police See, uh, of course, the uh, famed um, uh, Brasco. Um, uh, Donnie Brasco. Donnie Brasco, and played by Johnny Depp and um, um, Pistone, Joe Pistone. Jeez, I'm, I'm having yeah, some problems here. He was here. at my house for dinner here. He uh, had dinner here. We had like 20 guys over, and uh, Joe stayed here for like six hours. We were bullshitting and uh, we, I catered a dinner for everybody. We had a great time. And Joe normally doesn't hang out more than 15, 20 minutes in a place. And it's funny because the next day I get a call from my agent. And uh, he says, oh, I had Joe was at your house. I said, yeah, he's a great guy. You know, we hung out a long time. We had mutual friends and he came over to visit me. We spoke on the phone a few times before that. And now we're friends. And uh, he says, you know, Joe... He says, my agent says, I know Joe like 25 years, you know, and everything he goes, he says, fuck this, fuck that, fuck this, <laughs> that, you know. He doesn't hang out. He says, he raved about you going to your house and hanging out with your wife and your dog and your friends. And he stayed there six hours. And he was, he was great, Joe, you know. That's now, funny. Joe, Joe, looked, Joe looks really good. I think he just turned 80. And the guy looks like he's 50. Hey, it, it pays off to take care of yourself. I mean, oh, Joe looks great. Yeah. yeah, he's been he's been rock solid since he was working the, the families. You know, you see pictures yeah. of him. He looks like a a, a brick shit house. You know. Yeah. You know. You know. One thing I want to tell you about Joe, which is a funny story, because uh, before he came over, I had my wife watch the movie. You know, we all watched Donnie Brasco and stuff, and he wanted to really point out though that it was a Hollywood thing that he never slapped his wife around. Joe's a real family man. Yes. It was just something that was put in for entertainment and for effect, but he never touched his wife. You That's know, Joe's not that kind of guy. Yep. You know, that, very that, cool, collected, uh, you know, he wouldn't beat up his wife or slap her around. When I, I, brought, I wanted to bring that out to him because I had a couple of females were here. Right. And we didn't want anybody to get, uh, we wanted the truth. He wanted to make that a point. He takes pride in making sure that people know that. When I interviewed him, I asked him, you know, I know I, I realized this was a Hollywood production. What what happened in this production that you you would say is um, inaccurate? And he said, I've never, ever laid a hand on my wife. And I was oh, like, broke that up to you, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you see what I mean? It just goes to what I say. He's, uh, you know, that was really a Hollywood stunt they threw in. Yeah, you know, that's so that's 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 something you don't you don't really think of when you you volunteer, you, or you don't volunteer, but you get hired to let someone do that about your life and you lose a little bit of control. And now they're throwing stuff in there because exactly. it just makes a better story. It's like, geez. Exactly. Exactly. He was probably on the phone to his family, like, hey, mom, I, I never, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, that's crazy. Well, well that's a cool. Really nice guy. Yeah. He, he, you met him, you know. Yeah. He seems like a really, really good guy. I actually had him on with his, um, his uh, partner, business partner, uh, Leo, he was a, who's an actor. And um, he, they came out on as a pair, I think because he's such a private guy. Like he, he, he is, he's better being interviewed with someone who knows him, who can kind of bring well, it out of a him. Big, old guy? Um, geez, I can't, I can't yeah, recall. Uh, the guy, this, mean, this guy's been in a bunch of, um, he's been in a bunch of Hollywood movies. Uh, oh, he, no. He's been in a bunch of gangster movies. Oh, no, I thought I was thinking of somebody else because he has another good friend who he came over to my house with. But, you know, I had, being with Joe for six hours, uh, I had a lot of time to, we, in, you know, interacted, you know, eating dinner together, telling stories together, hanging out with other friends and officers I knew. It was really a very pleasurable experience. And he's a really down-to-earth guy. Yeah, yeah, you could tell. He, he's a, he's a know, great... Besides being a legend that he is. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah. I was trying to wrap my during the interview. I was trying to wrap my head around actually someone doing what he did, and it's just, just really cool. Yeah, it was an amazing job he did. Yeah, yeah. Just... I'm glad I meet him through a mutual friend of ours, a Bob Stockman, who um, just wrote a book also called Inside Both Courts. He 
He was a, he's a basketball coach and he was also an ice agent, you know, like back from like the old Miami Vice days. Right. You know, so that was his close friend and uh, they hooked up and then came up here. That's very cool. And I uh, invited over uh, a couple of state troopers, a couple of local police, some New York cops. Um, you know, we had a whole mix of uh, across the board law enforcement and it was a, it was a great time. Oh, I can only imagine. I, w- I would have loved to have been a fly in the wall. I would have loved to have been there handing my card out for some more interviews. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I may be able to hook you up with some other guys. Oh, I would, I would appreciate it. I'm always on the hunt. No problem at all. That's no awesome. So, Ralph, can you take us back? Take us back to young Ralph Friedman hitting the streets as a patrolman. Um, can you tell us about the first hot call that you went to, the first call that you you know, really got your adrenaline going and, and got you pumping? Well, the first thing that happened to me, uh, this is right out the door. See, now you got a picture like this. I was in the South Bronx, Fort Apache. This place had a real reputation for uh, like an old West uh, shoot 'em up town, you know, like Tombstone, you know? Yeah. So this was Fort Apache. And we didn't have training offices. Uh, it's nothing like you have today or in the last few decades, actually. But we were, you went out, you spent four months in the academy, you would train, uh, you know, with firearms, with a nightstick, uh, and with your hands. You know, we took judo and karate, full contact in the academy. Sure. But we didn't have mace, we didn't have expandable batons, we didn't have training offices, we didn't have radios. You know, we didn't have any of these kind of things that were available in today's society. So I walk out in uniform. And you don't even know where you're going. They give you a post, and you're supposed to find it. You, know, <laughs> you, look, on, you look on a map in the precinct, and you try to find your way to where you're supposed to be, right? So I get out. I'm not even one block from the precinct, and I see this large disorderly crowd, and they're screaming going on. I mean, I know something's going on. I have no idea what. And it's my first seconds taking a police action. I walk, I start walking into the crowd. I'm in full uniform. So they part a little and I'm walking in and right in the middle of this whole thing is a guy singing, dancing, balls ass naked. (laughs) You know, I mean, I know I got to stop it. I don't know what I really got. I don't even know if it's technically an arrest for public indecency or is he a nut, which we used to call a psycho back then which they call today an EDP, an emotionally disturbed person. Right. But uh, I, 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 all I did was put my cuffs on him and I saw walking him to the station house. I mean, he had no shoes, no socks, nothing, you know? <laughs> and, you know, the crowd sort of like, they're all screaming and chanting and stuff. And we had what's known as TPF working out of our precinct. That's Tactical Patrol Force. We had 425 officers assigned to the 41st precinct. And then on the top floor, there was a, a room that had 200 TPF. These guys are like the toughest of the tough. And they go out. If you have a problem in an area, they'll put like six of them on each or four corners. And they are all had to be six foot tall. They took no shit. Uh, they were like your hats and bats guys right away. Right. And you cleaned up areas immediately, you know. So they were all coming on out because it was at that time or they were all coming in to be on duty or and the guys getting out and off duty. So there's a lot of guys in front of the station house. And here I am walking up a real rookie. You can see everything uh, on me is brand new. Your uniform got the creases in it. Yeah. Your left has no cracks. You know, you're just walking up. And I got this nude guy and I'm hearing all these kind of comments, you know, guys at the pools that way. Well, I think you took a strip search a little too far there, right? <laughs> you know? You know, and I'm getting teased and everything. And I bring the guy before the desk. And <clears throat> obviously, when he was mumbling and all this stuff and what he did, he was psycho. We had an ambulance come in and take him away. But that was my first, first minute or two as being a police officer. Had wow. to take an act where everybody's looking at you. Not so much as me, but looking at what I, what's standing next to me, the other end of my handcuffs. Wow, that's awesome. I, it's funny. So that, you... that, that was pretty weird, though. No, absolutely. Weird and adrenaline all at the same time. Oh, sure. Yeah, putting cuffs on somebody for the first time, and especially in that but scenario. I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't consider it compared to the other stuff I've done or other police do 
I wouldn't have considered it like a dangerous situation. I mean, you could have got into a fight and stuff, but he was a little complacent. I you know, put the cuffs on him and he walked along with me. <laughs> right. I think he might have been happy to have company. I don't know. Yeah, that's, I mean, New York City's big for a foot patrol still, I think. I mean, when I was, when I became a police officer in Mass, there was a New York City guy at the um, pad exam, you know, the physical agility test. And right. he was, he was New York City guy for five years. And then he said, you know what, I'm going to come back to Massachusetts and be a cop up here. So we had to do the testing with us. This is back in early 2000s. And he said, not, I mean, obviously more field training, but he said after his field training was done, he got plopped in a neighborhood um, and was on foot and he would take reports like beanies and whatever the neighbor had, neighborhood had for him. He would write it down in his notepad, you know, which was, I thought was pretty interesting for, you know, such a huge department to still have uh, a foot beat like that, you know? Oh, you got to have foot patrol. Yeah. It's awesome. You know? Absolutely. It's very cool. Um, I got to ask, I got to ask you about this, Ralph. You said could yeah. ask anything. So, uh, sure. A girlfriend of yours tried to kill you. Can you tell the listeners about that? Well, I started going out with this girl. Oh, that, that <laughs> Sorry, you're, in, you're in demand. Yeah. Uh, I started going out with this girl that I met. And very pretty Spanish girl. And we started hitting it off. And we are going out a few times. And then it got to the point where I was supposed to go up to her house, you know, and now, you know, I know the, the, uh, the you know, our relationship was moving on. Okay, right. Say it, I get it. On the radio. Right. So I'm supposed to go up to her house, right? She lived in the neighborhood where I worked and everything. And I got jammed up making an arrest, you know, so I couldn't leave. I had a process. I ran into a good arrest and I had to take it and do all the paperwork and get this guy lodged. And we didn't have cell phones then, so I'm calling her on a hard line, and I'm telling her I can't make it tonight, which was killing me too, you know, I was waiting for this night too, right? And uh, I just couldn't make it, and she was really pissed, you know? And she says, well, I'll come over after, come over later. I said, yeah, but I gotta work the next day, let's just make it tomorrow night or the next night, whatever. And uh, she was like really uh, disappointed, so I thought disappointed. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the next day, I go back to work at being early and I'm process, you know, I'm driving around with my partner and we get a, uh, a code 10 to fourth width. And I don't know what it is in other departments, but in our department, NYPD, a 10 to fourth width means report to the station house immediately. But we look at each other and said, what the hell is that about? What did we do wrong now? You know, so we drive in and we get upstairs and we get up to our office and we could see in the boss's office. There's two guys with suits. So the first thing that hits your mind is it's uh, internal affairs. Right. right. But the boss comes out and he says to my partner, go back on patrol. Tells him to leave. Right. Says Friedman, come in the office. And you're like, oh, so boy. Yes, yeah, so I go in the office and, you know, never want to show weakness or anything. I walk in there like with a chip on my shoulder. Right. I go in there and say, yeah, what's up? So two guys identify themselves. And one's a boss and one's a detective. And they both work out of uh, Intel. That's the intelligence division. And Intel covers a lot of different areas, um, you know, of uh, throughout the city. There's different uh, details of Intel. Anyway, they were on a detail which involved getting information on violent crimes, I guess. And they tell me, do you know this girl, Lucy Santiago? I said, uh, yeah, I, of course I know. They said, were you supposed to see her last night? And now my mind's racing. I'm saying, how the hell do they know her? And how do they know I'm supposed to see her last night? Right. Stuff like that. Yeah, I had a date with her. I couldn't make it. I had a collar. You know, I made an arrest. So they said, well, we have intel from a very good CI, which is a confidential informer, that she had two or three guys in her bedroom closet with guns waiting to kill you. And I'm like, wow. my head's spinning. I'm saying, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> well, you know, they said, well, we have a very good informant. He's a uh, top rated informant. That means, you know, you get informants that give you, say, 10 pieces of information. Three might be good. Five might be good. When you get a guy who's a really good CI, 
at least nine, possibly ten out of ten, is good information. They said this guy is one of the best. Control. So he's valuable. He's valuable, and we and he's given us this information. And I said, why in the world would she want to kill me? So they said, well, six months ago or seven months ago, you had a shootout up on a roof in this neighborhood where you sh you shot two guys, killing one of them, and it winds up the guy you killed was her, bro her stepbrother. Now wow. it makes sense. This girl was setting me up, going out with me, leading me on, getting me to the you know where I'd be my weakest point. You know that is cold as ice, my man. <laughs> Oh my goodness. You know, I, she had a mission to do in uh, just a freak thing that I make a lot of collars and I made a collar that night and didn't make it. And the follow up with that, with that is I never saw her again, never answered my phone with her. And the thing is, <clears throat> we couldn't lock her up <clears throat> for two reasons. First, it's really the case as a he said, she said, and that doesn't go nowhere because there was no recorded evidence. There's no other witnesses. Uh, there's nothing to make a case on. Right. And you don't want to burn the CI because he's a good CI on a case that's going to get thrown out. But those two reasons, you just, you know, mark it up to we saved the cop's life, me and mine, and don't see her again, you know? Wow. So were you, were you looking over your shoulder for a little while? Uh, I'm always looking over my shoulder. Yeah. But that wasn't one of the things. I wasn't looking for someone that looked like her. You know, over my shoulder, I was looking for someone like her in front of me. You know. Yeah. Hey, can you tell us tell us about the the shootout on the roof? What happened there? Oh, that was a good story. What happened with that is, me and my partner were out. I was working with a guy and uh, my steady partner, Roger Cortez. May he rest in peace. Uh, so we made a collar on a purse snatcher. You know, someone grabbed the purse, robbed the person. We snapped them up. And we brought him into the station house, but it was near the end of the tour. So my partner went home, and I stayed on overtime processing the collar. And while I'm doing this, about an hour, hour and 20 minutes later, a CI of mine comes into the station house. And he tells me, Ralph, I got a guy who's selling me a gun now. So, so I go inside, tell my boss, uh, who was a really great boss at the time I was working with, a guy named uh, Stephen Cantor. Right, and he was my immediate squad boss. He was the CEO of the, of the detectives there, and he says, uh, "I give him all the information." And he says, "I'll be your partner." I said, "Okay, let's get this guy." So we put my prisoner in a cell. Tell the uh, uniform officers to hold on to him, watch him. We're going to go out and set up a gun buy. So we sort of knew the neighborhood, right? We knew the neighborhood. It was in our command, and we made up a plan. We told the CI to go upstairs. Uh, they were supposed to meet on a roof of a building. And this roof was connected to about four or five other buildings in the line on the block. So the plan was he was going to go up to the roof, meet the CI, uh, meet the seller, and get possession of the gun in his hand. We trusted that more than the, uh, the bad guy. Not that a CI is that good or bad, but... You know, we had more trust that if he's holding the gun, that we could grab the bad guy and we'll have nobody gets hurt, right? We were going to go down to the beginning of the block and go up to the roof through the fire escape, and then we'd cross over the connecting roofs and grab this guy. Once the CI, we were going to keep him in visual sight, and once we had a visual where the perp handed over the gun to the CI, we'd move in. So we get up in position. And the guy goes up, and as soon as he gets to the roof, things sort started to go a little sideways. The first thing we notice is that the bad guy who was selling the gun wasn't alone. There were two guys. Oh. So now we got three guys on the roof, which changes the scenario a little. We don't know if the other guy is armed. Uh, we don't know what kind of weapon he has, if it's a gun, knife, rifle, machine gun. We don't know. Then the next thing that went wrong was well, the, the seller didn't want to hand over the gun right away. It was, it winds up, it was a 30 30 hunting rifle, and he wants to prove that it works. Oh boy. So he leans over the roof and starts being a sniper. So that was it. We had to expose ourselves, you know, visually and verbally. 
screaming, police, freeze. Did he, sh- did he fire over. rounds, Ralph? Yeah, he was firing. At people or just, ran, just, just said whatever? Indiscreetly in the street. Oh, and there's geez. people all over the street. You know, so we had no choice. Wow. We had to immediately move in. Can't have a guy, you know, <laughs> right. sniping off the roof. Right? So we start jumping over. The roofs are connected. You just had to jump over like a two-foot or a three-foot divider mm. that separated each roof. And as we're jumping over, obviously we're both screaming, police freeze. The guy turns the rifle on us. So he fires. We open up. And we shoot both guys. The guy with the gun, he gets shot. Well, we shoot the first guy, the guy with the rifle. He gets shot in the hip and spins around. And we shoot, I shoot him again. He goes down, right? And now the other guy runs behind, looks like a, a chimney. You know, uh, they call it like a kiosk. We mm-hmm. can't see him. The CI hits the floor. He knows enough to hit the floor oh, yeah. immediately, right? But this other guy, the third guy who we weren't planning on, runs behind, behind this kiosk. So I emptied my gun on the first perpetrator, right? Now I pull out a second gun, right? And I'm going around the, this kiosk slowly because he's hiding behind it. And as soon as I make the turn, he's right in front of me with the knife raised in a, like a position like this to stab me in the head. Right there. Wow. I go to tighten my finger on the trigger to, to shoot him. And as fast, before I could even pull the trigger, I hear a shot. My partner went around the other way and saw he was going to stab me and shot him in the back to stop him. So the Oof. guy goes down, right? And my partner starts screaming, get the gun, get the gun. Right, so I he backs up to cover the guy that we shot with the rifle, that I could go and remove the rifle from his perpetrator that he just shot in the back with the knife. The guy leaps up again between, and I'm between the edge of the roof now and this kiosk and this perpetrator, and he goes to stab me, so I shoot him in the stomach, kill him. Then I run around and take the gun away. And then we sort of roughed up the two guys a little to make it look like the CI was part of them. And all the units are responding now. And we take them down. We leave with now other cops are there and the ME has to respond and the ambulances are responding. And they take the shot guy down, CI in cuffs, a little roughed up. So everybody thinks that, you know, he's just one of the three bad sure. guys. Damn. And it was really only two. And that's the guy that was killed. That I, that I got shot in the back by my partner, then in the stomach by me, and the shot that killed him. That was the guy whose sister was dating me months later. Wow. That's crazy stuff. It sounds like a movie jumping over the rooftops, you know? Yeah. Building to building. Yeah. You know, you're young, uh, young, dumb, and full of cum. You know, that's the combination. <laughs> You know, it gets you into these positions. Wow. So you are you said, I thought it was interesting, you said you fired your gun till it was empty, then you took out your second gun, so no reload. You just fired one gun till it was empty. Well, then you... Yeah, I always carried a second gun because one thing they taught us, they used to tell us, it's very hard to put those big bullets in those little chambers when mm-hmm. you're under fire. It's not like you're shooting at paper. You know, you could do a lot of practicing, and there's guys that are, uh, you know, Definitely great shots at paper may not be that good in the street. It's very different when you're under fire. You never know how you're going to respond. Thankfully, in the instances that I had, uh, I measured up. You know, most guys do, but there's always some that don't. You know, yeah. you don't know what you're made of until you're in that position. So you're talking you know, revolvers you here. Back, so, yeah, I always, I didn't tell you really another funny add on to that story. I'm a revolver guy, or what they call a wheel guy. I always use revolvers. Yep. I just happened to buy a, a, nine, a, a 380, which is like a 9 millimeter short. It's a, a llama. It's a piece of garbage gun. Yeah, my I dad has a llama 380. I just bought it off another cop for $60. And I was going to the range, right? Post carrier's gun on duty. But I was going to the range, and I signed into the range, a private range, and it was too crowded. I never got to get to the range, and I had to go to work. I took that one. I took that gun with me, 
as my backup because I was going to go to the range again later. And I happened to kill the guy with that gun. Got a little static, but IED investigated it and said, you know, he did sign into the range. Uh, it was his gun. It's a legal gun and all that stuff. But that was the only time that I used a backup gun. That was the eight. Wow, so the Llama 380, is that the one? What's that? I'm sorry, the Llama 380, was that the one that looks like a little mini 1911? Yeah, it's, it's small. It's not a very good gun. But I, I just, for 60 bucks, I thought I'd take it. Yeah, yeah. hey, sounds like it worked just fine. It, yeah, it definitely did. I, I hate to count on it, but it was the second gun. But I always carry two 38s, two snub nose detective specials. Gotcha. I always found them reliable, and uh, most of the time they do the job. I had a shooting where it took a little longer to do the job, but it did the job. Oh, really? So you never upgraded to the three fifty seven? I mean, I, I own these kind of guns now, but on the job, I never did. I know, New York City, yeah. were, you, were you allowed to have a three fifty seven back then? No, they were, you always carry, my, when I'm, my time on the job, you carried 38s. You know, they're either a Smith & Wesson or a Colt. I always opted for the Colt because it was a six shot where the Smith & Wesson snub noses were five. But the Smith & Wesson on duty, I think it's the M10, Smith & Wesson was a six shot. But, you know, in the academy, you train with that six shot M10 uh, with the long barrel. So most guys bought a Smith & Wesson off duty. And that was a five shot. I opted for the Colt, which was six. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't blame you. This way I had 12 rounds. I carried two Colts. It was six each. Yeah, now you get the now you get the Glock 17. You get, you know, 17 rounds in that one, one magazine. Well, you know, today's guns are made much better. You right. We were talking 50 years ago when I was on. Uh, you know, we, our thing was, what good is 15 shots if the first one jams? But today's guns are much better. You right. Know, you got your Glock. You know, there's a lot of other guns that are really made well, and they won't jam. So now they're more reliable. You know, so back in the 60s and 70s, you didn't want to count on a gun that might possibly jam when you only have one shot or no shot. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, of course. Ralph, can you tell us about your strange, strangest or most bizarre uh, call you dealt with? I had a lot of them, you know. I uh, bet. I'm trying to zero in on one. Um, I, this is the strangest call we had or incident that I got involved in. Uh, I hope it's not offending what I have to say. Though. No, let it rip. Okay. Uh, we were on patrol, and late, it was about uh, just getting dark, right? And we saw a guy that we knew was uh, – of not a great re reputation, let's just say. He was a street guy. Probably locked him up a few times, so he knew us. And he comes over and tells us his wife, who was abducted by a street gang and being raped. Ooh. So me and my partner knew where the headquarters was. So we proceeded over there, right? And it was like a basement in a uh, burnt-out building. So it was really a disgusting place, right? So we'd kick in the door, right? And the first, the sight we saw was, you know, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds made up or something from a movie, maybe a horror movie. But there were like, there was a guy raping his wife. And there was like about 25, 30 guys standing around in a circle, all jerking off on her as different guys are raping her. I mean, she was covered in sperm. Wow. It looked like something like a, it, was a, it was a horror movie with something that looked like it didn't. She was so covered. Actually, when they got the ambulance came and got it to the hospital, we started going in there. We called for backup and officers were racing over there. But we started wading through this crowd with our nightstick swinging, cracking heads, trying to get to our. And then we got to, the, got to the center, whacked this guy right in the head while he was having intercourse with her, raping her right there. So we got in the ambulance, took her out. But when they took her out of the ambulance, they had to hose the ambulance down and hug with like a garden hose 
at Jacoby Hospital before they brought her in, you really, it, it was something out of another world. Oh my goodness. You know, we wound up locking up. Uh, we only locked up four or five guys because the other everybody was scattered. But the ones who got clocked in the head pretty bad went down bleeding. We're able to lock. Pretty nuts scene. Holy cow, that's insane. And what kind of gang was it? I mean, it was one of these youth gangs on the street, you know, like uh, Savage Skulls, Young Nomads, you know. There was like about 12 different gangs in our precinct alone. And why did they take this guy's wife? She probably mouthed off to them or they liked what she looked like. And she was a prostitute figuring no one's going to care. You know, her husband didn't see it happen. I don't even know if anyone else would have reported it. You know what I mean? Then they would just leave her for dead or whatever. You find another body of a female in a vacant building. My goodness, that is that is so you know, intense. This is, kind of that, this is the kind of stuff that officers run into when you work in these ghetto precincts or, or uh, South Bronx precincts or in any city. You know, police work is dangerous and dirty no matter where you work. And I'm sure every major city has the same problems. But police officers and law enforcement see things. We see the underbelly of, this, of society. That your normal people that go to work, raise a family, pay taxes, go home, watch TV, and go to sleep, they do that peacefully because there's police officers out there that can handle this stuff for them. And they never see it, maybe hear about it on the news. But you can't comprehend stuff on the news because there's so many movies and shows and they talk murder and killing. People it doesn't it doesn't register in the mind of what a real murder and killing is, you know. People ask me, oh, are you a cop like uh, Clint Eastwood or so-and-so? I say, no, he's an actor. You know, they don't see or do what we do. They're imitating us. They're doing it by script, and uh, they're safe because of us. Yeah, they do everything in, in, in a... Um it's very romantic when they do it and very clean cut and very, they don't get, you know, they, yeah. they're not walking they in on a room with a woman being gang banged by 25 people covered in semen. That's not a scene in a Clint Eastwood movie. You know what I mean? No. You know, wow. That, but that is so disturbing. Cops deal with this stuff. I mean, it, it, it's horrible to see one girl, one person raping a girl, you know? Um, and it's just, it's just everything's taken out of text because people can't comprehend what these words mean because they don't deal with it in real life. They see it on the, sitting on their couch or in a theater. Yeah. I mean, when you went into this place. It takes on cops' minds and stuff. Some people it affects. You know, some people can't handle it. Some could and some can't, but it hardens you, you know? Yeah, we call it like um... – I've heard it referred to before, like kind of like um, growing calluses. When you're when you're a young cop, you see these things, and then you go home, you can't stop thinking about them, and, and it kind of drives you nuts. But as you, if you stick with the career and keep going, it bothers you less because you grow those like mental calluses. That's it. I was going to agree with you 100. percent That's a very good compa- comparison. Like if you're shoveling all day, you get these callus on your hands, right? And when you see these kinds of atrocities in the street. You know, you expect to see these in third world countries, but not in the streets where you're raising your family, you're living. It's it produces calluses in your mind. And and you hear cops have like black humor that helps them deal with stuff. Yeah. You know, sometimes they walk in and the guy is shot like six times in the back and one cop or detective will turn to the other and say, no, I think it's a suicide. You know? <laughs> right. but that's, that's cop humor. And they need that to deal with these kinds of situations. Absolutely. And, you know, we're not talking about one one thing. You work in a, a a ghetto precinct or what they call an A house or a shit house. You're seeing this stuff on the constant. You know, it's not. When I got to the forty first precinct, and I, and I was, in the beginning when I was a rookie in uniform, and I finally got to a radio car because you start on foot post, and when you get to a radio car, we were backed up in jobs like thirty or forty jobs deep. When you get the police car, they turn it over to you. The light and, on a Friday or Saturday night, 4 to 12, the light and siren is going. And you, you get in and the light and siren's on for eight hours. I bet. You, you, you don't even catch a break. <laughs> wow. That's how busy it was. The new jobs are coming in. 
the dirty job that made you a president. Wow. They just stack them on you and stack the calls, I'm sure, by priority. It's, a, it's like shoveling sand against the, the tide. Wow. You know, that's, never- that's incredible. Um, Ralph, can you tell us about um, one of your more intense or terrifying calls that you went on? A tense call? Uh, well, um, you're always a little tense, but that's good. That keeps you sharp. You know, you get the adrenaline pumping. Right. Uh, I'll tell you a story that was, uh, it was intense. We had a, a hostage situation, and this guy was holding two kids and his wife hostage. And the wife and one kid, a boy, managed to escape. And they called the police, and we responded. And um, they had this, the kid the guy was holding a, like a five or seven-year-old girl hostage at knife point. So we responded there. And this way back before we had uh, negotiation teams and, you know, it wasn't easy uh, back then to get an emergency service unit to respond. I mean, you, you handle a lot of stuff on a precinct level. So we were there and more units responded. It wasn't just me and my partner. It was a lot of people. But I was sort of up front with it. Me and my partner were in the beginning. So we were sort of like the front line. And we we broke into this apartment and the guy's holding this girl hostage and it was a standoff. You know, we didn't make any move. We didn't want her, him to hurt her and we didn't want to have to kill him. We didn't want any of us getting hurt. It was sort of a standoff. And <clears throat> this went on for a while. And this was a beautiful little girl with very long hair, as cute as could be. And all of a sudden, this guy took the knife and chopped her arm off right in front of us and with that I couldn't let this guy live I had my hand bun pointed right at him I go to tighten my finger before I could pull my finger back and shoot him the guy took the knife in a quick motion and cut his head off cut himself ear to ear across his throat his head flopped back and he just poured out blood right then and there holy cow that's you know, insane. I can't even tell you what kind of bloodbath this was. And I couldn't give a shit about that guy. He deserved to die. And if he didn't kill himself, I would have killed him. But this poor girl, you know, went into shock and she's bleeding out. She died too. It was just terrible. Well, and how old you was know, the girl? She was between like five and seven. And she passed away as well? Yeah. Oh, God rest her soul. My goodness. You know, it was a terrible, terrible thing. They tried to save her, rush, rush her to the hospital and stuff. But um, as far as I remember, she died. You know, it was like a big thing and all the bosses get involved and so much news coverage. And, and uh, I'll be honest, I'm 99% sure she died. I can't say 100%, I sort of forgot on that. But I, the image of that, that site is what I really remember, you know. Yeah. And he came in like a butcher knife, you know. It wasn't a big, like not a machete. But it was one of these butcher knives that were, uh, it's like a razor blade, you know? I mean, it was one, sh- one swift thing, he took off her arm and then his head. Holy cow. I mean, now, what? how far into your career were you at this point? Um, Not even two years. Really? And the, did... about, about a year and a half. It was right before, I was still in uniform. Oh, it was probably about a year and a quarter, maybe fourteen months. And did this did this screw with you pretty pretty hard? Well, in that fourteen or fifteen months, I have seen a lot of things in where I worked. Like I said, this Fort Apache precinct, the forty first, you saw a lot of stuff. I mean, I was already getting, I was a hardened guy already. It was, it just makes you hard, or you you fall apart. You know, the job me, it wasn't like that. I, I never dealt with stuff like that as a kid, you know? Yeah. Uh, I just, I, I mean, I was looking forward to becoming a cop once I took the test. I never thought about being a cop before that. But they trained us in the academy, and they took us places. You know, they took us out and you see things here and there. They took us to the morgue. That was a required thing. And in the morgue, you see people getting cut up. They're dead, but they, they're cleaned up, and then you see them get cut open. And as soon as you get to the precinct, 
I mean, the stuff that you'd see in an emergency room is beyond belief. I mean, I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people shot and stabbed. I've seen doctors, that, these, these medical doctors that work in a ghetto precincts, they're beyond amazing. Yeah. I mean, they, they cut into a chest, they'll open them up like an autopsy, get these big spreaders, open up their ribs, go right in there, massage the heart, take a bullet out of anywhere in your body. Yeah. I mean, they open you up. Uh, you can never believe you can be put together again like that. I think the only thing you'd see that, I wasn't in the military, but I'm sure military guys saw that. And a lot of cops that came on in those years was from the military. So they're hard and tough guys to begin with. You know, I really looked up to these guys. When I first got there, I was in awe of these police officers. I mean, guys that I work alongside of, they're, they're just amazing. And I said, man, I want to be like that. I want to be like that. And over the course of time, uh, I guess I did become like that. <laughs> yeah, I guess but, you I mean, did. <laughs> I mean, when we get, we, there's no field training, no neighborhood sp stabilization. There's no training for in the street. You know, you get out there, you see what other guys do. You work with someone, they educate you. You get an education, don't get me wrong, you get an education in the police academy. They do teach you very good. But you get another, like, I guess, in the field training, when you work with old timers who definitely know what they're doing, and they teach you. And I see guys coming in. I saw this guy, uh, may he rest in peace too, Stanley Gam. He used to come in with guys. Every single day he was bringing in stacks of heroin. Every day had a chest full of medals. He was a uniform guy then. And I was in order of this guy. I said, I just, I, he was like my Superman, you know what I mean? And the day came where I became his partner in anti-crime because he went to plain clothes and I went to plain clothes and they partnered and stuff. It was like, uh... Oh, Ralph, I lost you there. You're, Completely frozen. Can you hear me at all? Can you hear me at all? All right, I'm going to have to try to get Ralph call back in. Here he is. Ralph, can you hear me? Oh, lost him again. All right, hopefully he calls back in. We can reconnect here. That was... um. Some crazy story so far. Holy cow. All right. Let me see. He has not texted me. Hey, Ralph. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, did you, were you able to click back the link back in? No, no, it says reconnect. I pressed the button. Let me try again. Yeah, go, try, yeah, try clicking it from the email. Let me see the link again. All 
All right, here, I'm sending the uh, email with the link again. Just sent it. Did you get the email? Okay. Mine looks okay. The connection and everything I have is good, so. All right, we had a little bit of an interruption there. We had a connection issue, but Ralph, you're back. Um, so you were just saying, um, you know, you're seeing the, you were working with these guys, and you happened to be paired up with one of these guys that you were looking up to at the time. Yeah, that was a great feeling, you know, to be working with somebody I looked up that I learned a lot from. Well, there was a lot of guys like that in the four one, the forty first precinct in the uh, NYPD produced a lot of great cops, as did other uh, ghetto precincts. But four one was a very um, well-known precinct worldwide. People heard of it in other countries, you know, Fort Apache, and uh, it just it had a reputation that preceded itself. I, now, I found a picture online. you mind if I just throw this on here? Tell me about, a little bit about this guy. That was me in uniform. Is this at I Fort Apache? Out. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, I did all my uh, first years in uh, Fort Apache, first five years. It lo and, you look like a. You look like you're from a um, the old west here. It's awesome. You got like a bandolier on your hips <laughs> there with all the bullets. So you needed bullets, and it, I'll explain when we bought those that shotgun. Uh, we bought them ourselves. The police department didn't supply that. My unit, the four one anti crime, we bought twenty of those for the twenty guys. Wow. We used to go out and protect cops on duty and off duty because they were being attacked. So we'd follow them around. Um, we'd be assigned to a sector car and follow them. You're kidding, wow. The BLA, the Black Liberation Army. Yes. Was, they were ambushing police officers at the time. So this was, a, I was already in anti-crime when this shot was taken, but I, once in a while I go into uniform too, you know, for uh, special details. But that's how I looked in uniform before I went into anti-crime, which was plain clothes which was before I became a detective. You look awesome. You look like a legend. I mean, look at, for, number one, look at the 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 sideburns. And you could have facial hair as an NYPD guy back then? Well, I told you, I was an anti-crime man. Oh, so you... you like that in uniform. But if you were an anti-crime and went back into uniform for a day or a week, it was okay. Okay, that they makes sense. The hair, uh, goatees, beards, sideburns. But I was doing it and um, special assignments. That's funny you say the um, the BLA or whatever alliance. We had a, I had another guest said um, they actually tried to kill him uh, because of all of his uh, work he was doing with the uh, at NYPD. I, I the guy he was another legend. Oh, it was Peter J. Pranzo. Do you know Peter? No, I don't know him. He was MIPD. Um, he, he worked the Gambino crime family, and the Black Liberation Army put a hit out on him and his partner. So you may have protected him because he, he was a cop around the same time. No, I was protecting the cops in my own precinct. We were assigned in plain clothes and uniform to follow them. Oh, so you would have known if he, if he was in your precinct, you would have recognized the name. Yeah, I would have recognized the name. I, I don't recognize the name. Gotcha. Yeah, Sorry. he was a he was another great uh, MIPD copper. Um you guys should definitely get a drink sometime because he has, you know, yes. similar craziness happening. Um, wow, Ralph, this uh, <laughs> your stories are are they're fantastic. I can understand why uh, a network would want to have you on a show. Um, so cool. So, can you can you tell us? Uh, do you have? Can you remember a heartwarming situation? 
Well, like I said, we didn't do, I was in units and in precincts that we really didn't get cats out of the tree. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, our satisfaction was uh, taking down really, really bad guys that preyed on the weak. You know, when you get a guy uh, that you can get him solid. See, what happens is a lot of these guys have long rap sheets and they're arrested a lot of time. And what people don't understand is that when they, when they choose a victim, uh, it's somebody who's never testified before. It's somebody who's weak or frail. They pick on innocent people. And sometimes people can't testify and lawyers tear them apart. And these guys walk. Because a lawyer knows how to sure. you know, get around what the guy did. But what I did was when we were in anti-crime, which anti-crime is, it's like in between a detective and a uniform. If you take it down the basics, uniform deters crime. Anti-crime is there when it happens. And detectives that investigate after the fact. That's basically, because I was a detective who did like anti-crime work. And there's a lot of uniform men to go out hunting for arrests also. But I mean, if you take it basic, now being an anti-crime officer, you're supposed to be there while the crime is going down. And you either set up positions, you blend into the neighborhood, or you drive a taxi, a milk truck, a con ed truck, or you hide on a roof, or you hide in an alleyway. But you want to see the crime so you could testify and you become an uh, expert witness. And in that way, the, it's not all on the civilian. And this way, when we testify, we can put a guy away because we know what to say and how to say it. You know, because we know the laws and we witness the yeah. crime. You know? Absolutely. When you rely on just a civilian, they get nervous. They don't show up. They get scared. Uh, and when they, ner they if they do show up, they're nervous. And the, and the lawyers run rings around them. Yeah. Sort of try to make them look stupid. When they're not stupid at all, they're just a victim of a crime. And, you know, the lawyer plays the game and the criminal knows the game. And that's why they walk on a lot of cases. But when an officer, be it uniform, anti-crime or detective, have other evidence, like detectives can gather evidence or if a cop recovers something, then they get to testify in the case. And it's much more effective than putting a criminal away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is. It's sick, actually, when you see... You know, it falls on the civilian. It's not their fault. Yeah. That's how it has to work. Yeah. So if there's no one there but the civilian, what else could you do? So, Ralph, you had four righteous shootings uh, for NYPD. Um, how did that affect you? Did, did it have... Were you able to... I mean, they were justified, so you can feel good in that. Did, did they... Did it... Did the first one bother you? Did the last one not bother not, you? Or? Not at all. They, I didn't, they didn't bother me. They made me be even more cautious and more alert. Uh, I've always felt good. It made me feel like victorious because I was saving a life, either my own or my partner's or a civilian. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I know I did the right thing. And obviously the courts uh, agreed with me and found me justifiable in all four uh, in the line of duty homicides that I had to do. Yeah, no, I, I, I've, I've never had to do that, but I'd like to think, I'd like to think that if you're involved in a justified shooting, then there's nothing, there's nothing that should haunt you about it, I, except that maybe just the you know we were we were taught uh, that you might have to do this one day, and we're trained to do it. Right. You know, we're not trained to kill; we're trained to stop the threat. Uh, you know, if you have to fire one time or four times, you have, or five times or more. You have to stop that threat. If a perpetrator dies as a result of that. That's on him. You know, a lot of things that police do is more of a reaction. The perpetrator makes the decisions. You know, if they want to be cuffed and go to jail and no resisting arrest, then everything goes down and he's treated like a gentleman. But if he makes the decision to fight you, stab you, shoot at you, run away, you have to take, you got to react to that. And that's what we're taught to do. Absolutely. You know, we're taught to win. You know, we're the police. We enforce the law. It's not always a clean job. It's, a, you know, you got to get your hands dirty. You know, that you want to, but the perpetrator makes the decisions. We only react to it. You know, if they surrender, they go peacefully. They know the game. They get their day in court. They have a lawyer. Everything, no one gets hurt. But if they want to fight you, they want to hurt you, 
they want to kill you, they want to stab you, they want to shoot you, then you got to stop that threat. And if they die as a result of it, it's on them. I agree 100%. Ralph, yeah. we're, we're going on an hour here. I just want to ask you um, a couple more quick questions if you got a moment. Sure. Um, I got all night. Um, can you talk about your most memorable, intense case? Well, I'd probably say that was um, the first time I took a life. I was working, I was in anti-crime, and I went to court that day. I usually do night shifts or evening shifts, but I had to go to court. And another officer in my unit was in court. We both came back to the precinct, and we were in the same unit, but we weren't direct partners. So the boss put us together to finish out our tour. We had another four or five hours to go, and he put us together. So uh, we went out in a private car, and normally as anti-crime, you don't respond to radio runs, but it is very common to back up a uniform officer if it's a heavy run. So we were out, it was two o'clock in the afternoon, and a radio run comes over the air of a burglary in progress. So a unit picked it up, and you know, being the kind of cops, you know, we backed them up. This is what was commonly done, you know, everywhere. So we said, we'll back them up. Thing was, we got to the scene first. And as we were going, it said a girl screaming for help, which means it's a little more than a regular burglary. A burglary sure. normally doesn't have someone home, but now you have someone home, it's more like a home invasion. Mm. We didn't have those words yet in the vocabulary. Right. But you have an occupied apartment with a burglar breaking in. So we stepped on it and we happened to get there first. So we went up the stairs and it was on the top floor, of course. And as we got there, we heard the girl screaming. And when we got to the top floor, we actually saw the door was broken in. It was open about five or six inches and the door frame was messed up. So we knew someone broke in the door, right? So we go into the apartment, both of us, we have our guns out, we're in plain clothes. We keep screaming, police, police. And it was pitch black in there. We don't know for what reason, but the, they had curtains and drapes and sheets, everything over the windows, blocking out any kind of light. So it was pitch black. And later on, we found out that we entered like a living room area and there was a hallway going straight back that had a bathroom that would be facing you. And off to the right was a bedroom. And that was where the screams were coming from. So me and my partner made our way towards that hallway. We just entered the hallway. So now we got walls on both sides of us. You know, it's me, my partner, wall, wall. And out of nowhere, a guy jumps out of the bedroom from our right, standing right in front of us, which was three feet away. Oh, wow. And I'll tell you why that's important. But at three feet away, he starts shooting at us. Whoa. <clears throat> we open fire. Immediately, I see my partner get hit, right? And my partner goes down, and he's still emptying his gun trying to take the guy. And I'm firing, he's firing, and bullets are ricocheting. All we see is muzzle flash. I'm only firing at the muzzle flash. I can't see the guy. It was pitch black, and the guy was black himself, and he had no shirt on. Wow. And the three feet starts to get closer. He tries to run past me, right? He was hit a few times. But he ran right into me and I tried to count my shots, you know, and, you know, it was very quick, but I didn't want to fire everything I had. I had one bullet left right? and he ran right into me and I grabbed him by his trapezoid, his trap. Yep. And I held him and I had my gun. He ran into me. My gun was pressed against his chest and I fired my last round, killing him right there. Wow. And uh, backstory to that, my partner lived, thank God. That was the most important thing. By the grace of God, I didn't get hit. My partner took seven rounds, five direct hits. Whoa. Two were ricochets. So the, we wound up firing 17 rounds between the three of us. And that ain't counting how many bullets were flying around, you know, because they were ricocheting off all the, this little hallway. Yeah. My partner took a bullet in the back and one in the, in the forearm. But they were taken out in the emergency room with a tweezer. They were just under the skin. They were ricochets. But he took five direct hits. One went into the sack of the, 
right below the heart, there's a sac that holds fluid, and it went in there. But they saved his life. He made medical history, taking 72 pints of blood in three hours. Holy and cow. And he only hold about, I think, eight, nine pints, seven or eight pints. He took 72 pints of blood in three hours. But the backstory to this is, later on, the detectives that were investigating this case, they told the ME, you got an execution here. See, this is how rumors start. You know, but the ME said, you got an execution here. We got powder burns inside the body. But when I gave the detectives my statement and to the DA and to the shooting team, I told it just like I told you now, that it started three feet away and he ran into me and I held him and I fired my last shot pressed against him because he had powder burns inside his skin. They knew I pressed the gun against him, but the ME didn't know my story. Mm. If I would have said, oh, I shot him from six feet away, I would have been arrested because they could tell that I walked up and pointed it to him. Yeah. Sometimes you say the wrong thing, you could jam yourself up and, you know, it works both ways. But I told the truth. This is exactly what happened. And the forensic evidence proved what I said. You know, bullets make certain marks, certain blood trails, certain powder burns on the clothes, on the skin. All this stuff came into play and it totally jived with our stories. So wow. it was justifiable. I stopped the threat. Um, the threat, who was the man creating the threat, threat died from, as a result of it. But that was his problem. And thank God my partner lived. And thank God I didn't get hit. That's incredible, Ralph, that you, your partner was hit that many times and you were hit zero. Yeah. We didn't even wait for an ambulance. Let me tell you, the responding officers were there like in seconds, literally in seconds, maybe 10 15, 20 seconds, because they were responding anyway. But once I picked up my partner's radio and said, I got an officer down, my partner shot. I mean, let me tell you what happened. So many cars converged on the scene that an ambulance wouldn't be able to get there anyway, because it was a small block. The decision was made immediately by the officers that responded that we would carry him down and put him in a radio car. And any big city officer would understand what I'm talking about. The whole street was jammed up with cars, so we get him in the back seat. I stayed at the scene. I helped carry him down, but I had to stay at the scene to explain to bosses what happened, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, still, we got an officer shot. I unloaded my gun. Uh, I mean, he unloaded his gun, and we got a perpetrator dead who emptied his gun. So I've got, I got to be there to explain. So they rushed him to the hospital, but it was hard getting out of the spot. The police car had to hit other cars to bump him out of the way just so they could get out, get out of the block. Yeah, I bet. And then the officers, very smart move, they radioed highway patrol. So the highway units, you know, which is about motorcycle cars and motorcycles, blocked every intersection so the police could race through like it's a racetrack. They didn't even have to take caution or slow down. Even though they got a light and siren, you take caution going into an intersection. Sure. Because you have cars come. No cars could invade this these intersections because highway blocked everything off. So the police officers had a straight run and got my partner to the hospital immediately. And they saved his life because of that. Thank God. Yeah. The doctors and nurses did a great job, but they couldn't do their job if we didn't get them there fast enough. And that that was a result of highway, first result of the police officers in the 401 making the decision not to wait for an ambulance and carried them down five flights of stairs, put them back in the back of a radio car. Then to notify highway and for highway to respond in such a great manner, close every intersection that, you know, it was pedal to the metal and officer to the hospital immediately. Wow. That's incredible. That is crazy. Holy, holy cow. And this, uh, your partner, is he still around today? Yes, he is. He retired on a medical. Uh, obviously he couldn't go back to uh, policing and, uh, he went on to lead a, uh, a normal life, believe it or not. He became a property manager Thank in uh, goodness. another state, another Northeast state, and he's doing well. And, you know, I spoke, we spoke here and there over the years, but one year I mentioned an interview like this where I mentioned about the two bullets, and we were talking, and he says, you know, I have a scar on my arm, and I never knew how that one got there. I really? Said, yeah, you took a bullet there that they removed with a tweezer. You know, he was out of it a long time. Yeah, I bet. You know, and I, I, 
you know, he had to concentrate on getting better and stuff. It took years and years. But, you know, I guess, you know, you concentrate on all the bullets you took, not a scar on your arm. It, didn't, it wasn't a bullet uh, wound, you know, like inside the body. It was just under the skin, and they ripped the skin, taken it out, and left the scar. You never knew how he got that scar because I guess, you know, you get so many IVs and yeah. uh, injections and tests and sure. scopes and this and that. You're like a pin cushion anyway. Wow. But he, never, he didn't know that for decades later. That's amazing. Ralph, one of the, one of the most um, popular questions we ask here is um, advice for new officers or people looking to get into the job. We have a lot of listeners that are, are in police academy or looking to be police officers, and they really value uh, someone with your kind of credential um, giving them some advice. So what would you well, say to the, the new one? Uh, anything I did, don't do today. You'll lose your job. <laughs> you know? But policing is a very tough job. I think it's even tougher today. As bad as we had it against perpetrators, we had the backing of our bosses, we had the backing of politicians, we had the backing of City Hall, and we had the respect from politicians. And, uh, and these things were important. And today, uh, I don't think the police officers have that kind of backing. And yeah. a tough job when you don't have backing. Police officers are being used as pawns. But they're the ones that do the job, and they're the ones that... Uh, they, they should be. Everybody should be thanking God that there's men and women want to do this job today, and they're better trained. There's more technology, more sophistication. Uh, everything is just better, and they could do a great job if they were allowed to do their job, and they're capable of doing it. Absolutely, it's very uh, true. And I would just tell them, be careful and watch your partners back at all times, and. Uh, just do the best you can. You're doing a great job. People need you. They may not know they need you. Uh, I think a lot of people respect you, but it's uh, a small, um, small majority of people that are very vocal. You know, it's like it's like the uh, the, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Right. You know, you can have seventy five percent of the wheels work, three out of four work, but the one who's making all the noise gets the attention. And that's how it is today. Uh, you got these groups that are causing chaos and doing crimes, and you got politicians that cater to them. They look for this voting block. Right now, it's not a good time, but these times will change. The pendulum always swings. Yep, that's the truth, isn't it? It'll, it'll swing to the left, it'll swing to the right, but it settles in the middle. And policing was always a, no, a noble job, and decent people still need you and respect you. Yeah, wise words, that's very true. Ralph... Friedman, retired NYPD detective. Thank you so much for coming on. You told some incredible stories. I know you've got so many more in you. Um, if you're up for it, love to have you back at some point to, to chat chat some more. It's my pleasure to come back. I do have a lot of stories to tell. Uh, and it's my honor for you having me on the show. Steve, oh. it was a pleasure. And you just let me know when you want me to come back. Thank you, sir. Let me do the outro, but will you hang on the line so I can chat with you after? Sure. All right, great. Hey, guys, that was episode number 82 with Ralph Friedman, NYPD legend. Um, holy cow. <laughs> some some wild stories. I mean, stories like Ralph told are why I started this podcast because um, people need to hear them. People need to hear what uh, police officers have to go through and what they see, how bizarre and crazy the world really is, how shielded you are from it and what these guys and gals are doing, um, to make your modern life have a semblance of normalcy. You know, the, the, it's just, it's just crazy. Um, Ralph was a super fun interview. Um, he's got a book from 2017, the street warrior, um, NYPD's most decorated detective. It gets rave reviews. Go check that out. I'll put a link to it. And then, um, uh, more importantly, He's got a new series here um, on uh, in investigation discovery. Same same um, network as Joe Kenda's um, series. It's available on Amazon Prime and Apple TV. Uh, fantastic series. They got one season right now. Go check that out. Um, so thank you guys for listening. Thank you for checking out the podcast. Thank you for the ratings and the reviews. Um, and thank you for... Um, 
for all the messages and emails I get, the notes I'm always getting from you guys encouraging me to keep doing it. You guys know that I work a lot. I am an active police officer and I do have to work a lot of hours to support my family, but this is a passion of mine. Um, the, the reason I've said it before, but the reason I can get, get somebody like, um, retired detective Ralph Friedman, the reason I can get somebody that caliber on, on the show is because of you guys rating the podcast and reviewing it and people hear about it. And, um, and then, you know, then I get these, these crazy, crazy stellar guests that uh, have these amazing stories. And, um, and that's not to overshadow. I, I, I love interview guys like Ralph, super fun. I also love interviewing just, just a beat cop, um, from a city or state or county that's out there doing it. That's also very fun and interesting. People love that too. People love to hear a cop tell stories. It never gets old. You, you wouldn't believe it, but even even a little town with a little police department to, to two thirds of the residents of that town, the police department is like this clandestine little part of the part of their town government that they don't know anything about. So to hear the guys and gals tell their stories of what they deal with, People just love it, and it really brings appreciation to the profession, and I'm just so appreciative to all you officers out there that have come on the show. Um, go to thingspolicec.com, scroll down, click Be a Guest, give a quick um, quick little description um, of your, your, your rank, your department, and some stories you want to talk about. You don't have to list the stories, just you know, quick like crazy domestic or insane car um, rollover or, you know, um, drug bust, whatever it is, just so I get a little taste of what, what you want to talk about. And I will, I will reach out right away and schedule you, schedule you to come on. Um, that's how the show keeps going with, with cops that want to come on here and tell their stories. So I encourage you to do that. Even if you're a little, there's a little, um, if you're a little shy or you're not sure, reach out, we can chat about it. And I bet you have a good time when you come on and, and tell your story. So thank you guys so much. Um, that's the episode for, for this week, and I look forward to next time.